So today I'm gonna talk about our worst fears, sweetest dreams as we go into the future. I'm gonna talk about our worst arch enemies, you know, fearful people who would all probably take over jobs and you know, but at the same time, I'm gonna talk about our best friends, our most faithful supporters. Uh, Today, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. Now, uh, people are so concerned about artificial intelligence, right? Uh, people talk about singularity. These intelligent machines might actually overtake us and become even more intelligent than us. You know, and we also talk about existential risks. We might actually perish within the next few decades as a species, so that there will be no more of us on this planet. So, you know, there are all these talks about artificial intelligence, but I think, uh, you know, here we ne really need to put it into historical perspective. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, Francis Fukuyama wrote this very famous essay titled The End of History, in which he argued that the human society more or less have reached an optimum state. Specifically, he argued that the combination of free market and Western-style liberalism was the final answer, so there would be no more need for us to explore other alternatives. During this Cold War, there were two camps in the world, right? On one side, we had believers in the free market, free enterprise led by the United States, and on the other hand, we had people who believed in socialism and communism led by the Soviet Union. So Francis Fukuyama's argument was, now the game was over. We know the answer. Free market and Western style liberalism would flourish forever and ever, amen. <laughs> but you know, uh, at the time, it kind of made sense because the Berlin Wall collapsed and the Soviet Union dissolved. So it seems as if Francis Fukuyama had a point. But looking back on the last few decades since then, we are not sure. Today, it seems that we are at a crossroads again. Because with the advent of artificial intelligence and other advanced technologies, we have actually different ways to organize our society. So there are definitely different alternatives. On one hand, there are people who believe that with the help of artificial intelligence, maybe we can make society function more efficiently. Namely, we can probably define an evaluation function. Now, this evaluation function is the key to understand artificial intelligence. It's a measure by which you, you know, kind of evaluate a performance of a system. So, you know, if we can define an evaluation function for the society, maybe we can make the society function more efficiently. We can probably rate each, at each people's you know, behavior, performance, give them a you know, kind of score, and treat these people differently depending on the scores. So for example, if you have a high score, maybe you can get housing loans, you can get into prestigious universities, and otherwise treat it favorably in the socio-economical uh, framework. On the other hand, if you have a bad score, you might have trouble even getting a train ticket. You know, this is already happening. So this is the idea that in order to optimize the performance of society, we might have to kind of compromise on individual freedom and privacy. On the other hand, there are people who, including myself perhaps, believe that individual freedom and privacy is very important so that, for example, even if face recognition technologies can be used in conjunction with artificial intelligence to prevent crimes, you know, we should really, really not uh, unleash the full potential of this kind of technology without some concern for uh, privacy and, you know, freedom to move around in society without being monitored. So there are these two different alternatives. And this, you know, people, this is a really serious issue. 
I would predict that in the coming years, the great divide between these two different ways to organize society and different people who kind of subscribe to these different ideas, this the confrontation or the competition between these two camps would be probably as acute as what we had during the Cold War. However, this is very important. I'm not you know, just talking about nation state. Because nowadays, as you know, nation states are not the only players. We have private companies, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, the usual suspects, right? <laughs> so, you know, things are getting really more complicated. You know, so I, some people say that actually this is going to be Cold War 2.0. But you know, it'll be something more different, you know, something more personal maybe. So I think it is very beneficial to talk about personal perspectives as well. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, uh, when I was a college student, a couple of decades ago, <laughs> you know, uh, of course I did care about grades. But at that time, we didn't take grades so seriously actually, we actually, did skip some classes, extracurricular activities like seeing your friends, going to the cinema, just hanging around, were equally important as attending classes and getting great, great, good grades. However, nowadays when I go to universities in Japan, give lectures, I'm amazed that almost everybody has turned up. The students are so eager to you know, get good grades, so you know, it appears that you know the name of the game have changed completely in Japanese universities, which might be a good thing. But you know, at the same time, you must remember any evaluation function, no matter how efficient it is, is not a whole story. I mean, life is much more complex. So nowadays, uh, I see this trend that people are almost starting to internalize the ethics and computational principles of artificial intelligence, even before they become dominant. I see this tendency for young people to kind of adjust their behavior so that they would get good grades and you know, good ratings, even before the big brothers come to us. You know, from my perspective, I studied the brain, and the brain has evolved to sustain ourselves as biological entities, life has been always something greater than rating or grades. For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, choosing your romantic partner is arguably one of the most important, or maybe the single most important choice that you're gonna make in your life. Now think, uh, for example, uh, if you're a girl, would you say, well, I actually don't fancy this guy. I don't think we are made for each other, but you know, wait. He has a rating of 8.7 out of 10. <laughs> well, although I really don't feel anything for him, but maybe I should go on a date with him. Do you say that? Or alternatively, uh, I like this girl very much. Maybe I love her even, but ouch. She has a rating of only 7.4 out of 10, below the eight point threshold. So although, although I, you know, I have really a genuine feeling for her, maybe I should give it, miss, give it a miss this time. Do you say that? No. <laughs> Life is about intuition, because intuition goes beyond context. You know, we sometimes have to go out of the box, you know, think beyond borders. Artificial intelligence systems cannot do that because they cannot function without big data. You know, do you know when you have big data? You have big data for something you know, that has been repeated many, many times. However, did you realize that you live your life only once? You don't have a big data for your life because everything happens just once. So, you know, uh, you, know you can't really apply an evaluation function on which artificial intelligence actually drives to your life. You, so there's 
life is something else. I think this is a very important point to realize at this crucial moment when we as a species are at a crossroad. As I repeat, there are di really different ideas about how to organize a society uh, in today's world. Some people even talk about digital Leninism. Have you heard this word, digital Leninism? It's, a, it's this idea that with the advent of artificial intelligence and ICT technologies, you can organize the society so well that the function of the society will be optimized with perhaps some effect on individual freedom and uniqueness and privacy. It's already happening everywhere. So there's this trend. But on the other hand, as I believe, uh, we really need to keep uh, individual uniqueness, privacy. And you know, it's very important to, you know, not to restrict this kind of argument in the domain of political correctness or anything. This is something scientific. Uh, this is something more computational. The key question is, can we really define an evaluation function for anything that is important in life? In the game of Go, in the game of chess, it's easy. I mean, you know, people make such a big fuss about, you know, artificial intelligence systems uh, winning uh, over human champions in Go or chess. But wait, wait, these are really simple games. I'm sorry for any people who are, you know, <laughs> playing chess or Go professionally. But I have to state the truth. These are really simple games compared to the game we play, life. You know, uh, to be honest, I think in the coming years, we have more freedom to be foolish. You remember the great talk by Steve Jobs, stay hungry, stay foolish, or Elon Musk's uh, really beautiful argument about the clever foolish matrix, in which he argues that the success, the really big success, is in the domain of where you know, people think what you're doing is foolish. Well, I don't want to be a name dropper here, but don't you think the fact that people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk you know, say hi highly of being foolish tell you something? You know, the good news is because of artificial intelligence, in the future, we would have more freedom to be foolish. You know why? Because these technologies would provide an infrastructure. For, for example, if you make an engagement to meet at Tokyo Station nowadays, you don't specify time and place so exactly, right? I mean, you, you say just, oh, let's meet at the Tokyo Station. And you don't you know, go to specifics. Why can you do that? Because you, know, you have all these modern technologies, ICT technologies and so on. You know, in the future, we would be more foolish. We can afford to do that. And you know, being foolish is very important because children are foolish, aren't they? <laughs> they make many mistakes. They make you know, they say irrelevant things and so on. But that's how they learn. You know, being foolish takes us back to our childhood and you know, where the learning curve was so steep. We learned many, many things every day. We can do that. So, you know, my final message to you, I know many of you are students, let's skip some classes. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about good grades. Well, please do, you know, care about grades. That's important in today's world. But, you know, I really want you to remember that life is always bigger than grades or ratings, you know, because life is about stepping out of the box and jump into the great blue ocean of life's innovation. So stay human, stay foolish. Thank you very much. <laughs>